It's kind of loud. It's more comfortable than that. Well, thank you everyone for coming. My name sure. is Buffy or Sydney Crampton. Um, I'm past president of the Lemon Bay Conservancy. Uh, way back in the 90s, I think it was. But um, anyway, we're very excited and honored to have our Lemon Bay Conservancy represented today. And Eva will be the speaker, but she did ask me if I would just do a brief history of the Lemon Bay Conservancy. Because we've been here at the Beach Club since 1960. So we're celebrating our 60th decade this, this year, 10 years, 60th first season actually this year. So um, back in the 70s, there was a developer that was going to come in and put a huge mobile home park at Stump Pass, at the island across from Ski Alley. They were going to build a bridge there and have um, a huge development right on the water, but right near the pass and right near a very vulnerable area. So it just happened that um, Bill, Bill, William Vanderbilt had a house on Minnesota Key. So we went, a few of us, uh, my parents, went and talked to Mr. Vanderbilt and said, I think we should try to help preserve these islands. And they took him on our sailboat down to Stump Pass. Well, sailing by the islands, really got a feeling for the um, beautiful area. And so, so the next thing we do, do, the nature conservancy from um, the National Conservancy was coming down to help buy the islands so they could not be developed. And then um, they wanted to have a local group to stewardship the islands for them. So the um, Lemon Bay Conservancy was formed. And those islands are still under our, our um, protection. So then from that time, we got involved in helping the local counties set up passive parks around Lemon Bay. So we have Lemon Bay Park, Blind Pass Park, some Pass area, Cedar Point Park, and all these in Shamrock, all were helped by the Conservancy to become passive recreational parks for um, birding and conservation. So the Lemon Bay Conservancy has been very active over the years, and um, the latest project, which we'll talk about today, um, Eva Furman's been involved with since 11 years, I think she said. <laughs> yeah. yeah, so she is on the board of directors now, and um, so am I, I'm back on, so I'm very excited. <laughs> but um, she holds a BA from Vanderbilt University and an MBA from the University of Miami, and she worked for IBM for many, many years, and in retirement decided to help us, the Conservancy, um, create a habitat of restoration at Wildflower Preserve, which we now call Lemon Creek Wildflower Preserve. And she will discuss the two million restoration of the golf course in Grove City. So we're also planning a walk there on Thursday, January 15th this week. So if you'd like to go down and see the, the, um, the preserve um, from what she's been speaking about today. And so the non-profit um, the got involved through the water quality. That's how um, we were able to purchase the property and providing a permanently protected refuge for wildlife. So once again, we appreciate you coming to the Beach Club and as you can look around, we are trying to preserve the history and the nature of this area. So um, we appreciate your support and now I'd like to welcome Eva Ferner. Thank you. Okay, uh, can you guys hear me with this sound system? No. 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 Okay, well, we're going to try this one, but it fades out when I go that way. So, okay, so you can't hear me over here. Oh, maybe. Can you hear me? Okay, good. At the moment. Okay, nope, now you can't. I can't get it any closer to my mouth. That has been recommended. There you go. <laughs> All right. Can you hear me at the moment? Okay. 
Um, thanks everybody for coming out. And those of you in the sun, feel free to move to the shade if you get too hot. Um, but I am going to talk today about the project Lemon Bay Conservancy has done at the, what used to be the Wildflower Golf Course. So how many of you actually played golf at that golf course when it was still present? I see one hand. <laughs> okay, you're the old timer. Okay, and how many of you have been out to the old golf course since we turned it into a preserve? Ah, good. Okay. And how many of you have been out there in the last year? Okay, well we have a lot of people who can help me with the presentation then. Um, let me start with where this golf course is for those of you that don't know. Can't hear me again? Okay. I, um, is it any better when I get over here? Okay. Well, focus on the first uh, visual over there on your on my right, your left, I guess. Um, the the golf course is located off of Placida Road or the old golf course. Um, so it's about 30 minute drive from here. If you were heading toward Boca Grande, you'd pass Rotunda Boulevard West and then it's the second turn after that. And we are gonna do a walk out there on Thursday at 10 o'clock. So everybody's welcome to come out and I'm gonna take people around so you can see the habitats. And we'll pass out a little piece of paper at the end that has the address for everybody that may not know where the preserve is. Um, but when you look at that graphic over there, maybe you can see that there's a squiggly turquoisey line there. Um, and that turquoisey line is the creek that we call Lemon Creek. Lemon Creek feeds into Lemon Bay underneath Placida Road. So you would never know that it's actually connected unless you've done uh, a lot of uh, walking around out there. But there are mangroves on both sides of Placida Road and right there at the Lemon Bay Golf Course, there are four culverts that come under Placida Road and bring the creek up into our preserve. And also down to the south, it goes into what's called Lemon Lake, which is part of the county's Amberjack Preserve. So it's that connection into Lemon Bay that really caused a lot of interest in this property because all of the water flowing off of the old golf course eventually works its way out into Lemon Bay. And where does the water that come from that's coming onto the golf course? Well, if you look at this second graphic here, and you can maybe see all of the red arrows that are there in the graphic, that um, is storm water that flows in from the surrounding neighborhoods to the golf course. And the reason it comes into the golf course was this was all part of a planned development community in the early 1970s. And so they planned it so that all the excess storm water from the neighborhoods would flow onto the golf course to be used for irrigation purposes. Now the bad thing about storm water is it tends to have a lot of things in it that you don't want to end up in the bay. You know, people's car chemicals and fertilizers and lots of things that aren't really good for uh, the bays and our habitats. Eventually the bay of course connecting out into the Gulf. So we have all of those stormwater inflows that are coming into the property. Let me, I'm going to try again to come over here so I see if you can still hear me. Okay. okay. Um, so all of this water, plus all the rainwater that falls on the property, comes into the pond system. And over here on the east side, these are freshwater ponds, freshwater. And it feeds to the west side where we've got the brackish waters of Lemon Creek where it flows out to Lemon Bay. What happened in the old golf course plan, and this background picture is what the course looked like about 2006 is that there were underground culverts represented by these kind of pinkish purple lines on the graphic that connected the various golf course ponds. And so it allowed all the water coming in here to work its way through the drainage system and end up eventually over in Lemon Bay, Lemon Creek in Lemon Bay. We started doing water quality testing in 2011 after the Conservancy bought the property 
and we know that um, there are a lot of excess nutrients, primarily nitrogen and phosphorus, that are in the waters inside the golf course. And so about that same time, 2011, we started talking to the Southwest Florida Water Management District about what could we do to improve the water quality before the water moves out to Lemon Bay. These golf course ponds that you can think about that were there are typical golf course ponds. So they have steep sides. They go down about five or six feet deep in some cases, not always quite that deep. But they're not really good ponds for adding any plantings around the sides. The reason you want to add plantings is so that you can put filter that water before it comes out to the bay. This microphone is really bothering me. Can you guys hear me with it? Okay. It feels like uh, cuts in and out on me. Okay, so cut out right now, right? Okay, so the, um, the, the situation with the golf course ponds needed to be modified if we were gonna improve the water quality. And the way to modify it is to expand the edges of the ponds out and create more gradual slopes. And that allows you then to put plantings around the ponds and there are uh, quite a few of our native plants that are very good at absorbing excess nutrients. So by expanding the ponds and putting those plantings around them, then we can improve the water quality before it moves on out into the bay. So that was one of the key things that we started talking to the Southwest Florida Water Management District about. And around 2012, they actually approved a $200,000 design grant that um, they treated our purchase, the Lemon Bay Conservancy's purchase of the pro property as a matching funds. And they brought in a firm called Shada Environmental and started creating a design plan for how we might modify the golf course. Um, that project took a couple of years because they had to go out and survey all of the elevations and figure out what they were going to do. And so then we had to go in for more grant money to uh, get the construction to happen. So around 2015 we applied for another grant, um, this time about 550, 600,000 with the Southwest Florida Water Management District to start the construction. Soon after that, it became apparent to us that that, that would not be enough. So we applied for a grant with NOAA, the National Oceanic and Atmospheric Administration. They were doing a uh, nationwide uh, grant request for groups that were doing coastal habitat restoration and out of the 40 applications, they picked six, and this project was one of them. So they put in another 422,000. Um, so at that point, we thought we were ready to go, but then Swift Mud had other projects that they needed to do, so they held off till about 2018. And then we finally got started, the first phase. If you look at the first picture over there on my far right again, you can see how the golf course had disappeared from the time it closed in 2006 until 2011 when we first bought the property. That picture is made in about 2011. All the fairways had pretty much disappeared. And so what we had out there at that point was a mass of Brazilian pepper. And <clears throat> Brazilian pepper, if you don't know much about it, is very hard to get rid of once it becomes uh, a large plant. You can't, even if you cut it off at the base and take all the vegetation away, just regrows. And if you don't put herbicide on that cut within 30 minutes, you won't kill the plant. The only other way to get rid of it, which is what we did eventually, is you bring in huge earth moving machines that basically come in with a grinder and they pull it out by the roots. And that's what we had to do when we started the project. So they went throughout the property and pulled out that uh, Brazilian pepper by the roots and then mulched it so we can, once it's actually pulled out, you can leave it in place and use it to improve the soil as the mulch degrades. 
So that was that piece of the project. So that was the first step. That started happening about 2018. Now part of the project was when you create a bunch of wetlands, you've got a bunch of dirt that you're taking out. And so what were we going to do with that dirt? Well, the original plan was that we were going to take that dirt and allow the contractor to sell it off-site. And by selling it off-site, they would offset some of their expenses from doing the project, and that would maybe keep us within budget. But about that time, they tested the soil, and they discovered that there was arsenic present in some of the soils on the site. We were kind of surprised about that because we had done an environmental survey, and that, that had not turned up. But it turned out that it's a very common problem in old golf courses around here. Probably any course you play that was created in the 70s or even potentially up to the 90s, they used arsenic in the fertilizers and, and insect treatments that they did out on the fairways and the greens. So most courses in Florida do have the same situation, but we had to stop the project. And the water management district said to us, well, it's your land, go figure out what you're gonna do with it. Well, that was not a very comforting thing for a small nonprofit to try and figure out what we we're gonna do with an arsenic situation. But we were very lucky. We found two professionals who work in this soil contamination issues on a regular basis who agreed to give us pro bono support to address the problem, or hopefully address the problem. So an attorney named Laurel Lockett, who's uh, out of a company called Car Carlton Fields up in the Tampa area, got involved. And she brought in a gentleman who was was a toxicologist also with a firm called Geosyntex and between the two of them they started looking at what we should do to analyze the soil and figure out how to proceed. So they did a, a whole series of soil testing all over the site and they got involved talking with the Florida DEP about what our options were. In the end what we decided and when the DEP concurred was that the project could proceed, but we could not take any of the soil off site. Um, so essentially they said, well, you're not really in danger if you're just walking around on the soil. I mean, you're not in danger at the golf course when you're playing, for example. Um, you probably don't want kids digging in the soil. Um, you don't want to try and sell it somewhere else where it could introduce contamination. So you got to keep it on the site. So we had to stop now, we know what we need to do, but we had to redesign the plans in order to keep the soil on site. And the solution that we came up with was to create some hills and berms uh, on the site so that we could uh, do something with all the soil we were gonna excavate. So that's really what this next chart then shows you is what did we do? So if you look at the purple areas over on the, the second chart, that's where the golf course ponds were. And on the west side of the property, so the far left of the chart, is where Lemon Creek flows in and out of the property. So we left Lemon Creek here, where it was, but we expanded the estuarine wetlands by building out uh, shallow edges along the creek at the north end and then also expanding over here. We basically took two of the old fairways and dug them out and created an entire new lagoon there. So we just about tripled the amount of estuarine wetlands that we've got out there now. On the other side, we took out most of the culverts and we expanded the banks of four of the ponds out to the sides so that we could then put in uh, plantings all around the edges of those wetlands. And so what we have now is we've got all of that new wetland area and then in the green on this chart, you can kind of see the solid green areas. Those are the places that we deposited the soil that we took out of the wetlands as they did the excavation work. And they have turned out 
wasn't part of the original plan, but they've turned out to be a great benefit because if you are out on our trail network and you walk up on top of the mounds, you can now see what's going on out in the wetlands. And those of you who come Thursday will get a chance to see how this all is beginning to develop. So last year, 2021, is when most of this, sorry, 2020 is when most of this work was going on because we actually opened the preserve in January of last year. At the time that we opened it, there was still a lot of bare ground out there. Um, after the wetlands were created, we put in 80,000 wetland plantings along the edges of the ponds and the estuarine system. It's kind of amazing to think about what does it take to put in 80,000 plants, even if they're small. Most of them, though, you're putting in in the water, so we had professionals that came in and did that planting work. And then there were 14 zones in the uplands that we planned around the preserve where we've put in uh, about 12 varieties of trees plus shrubs and grasses that hopefully will take over and eventually eliminate the pepper problem that we had before. So the major aspects of the restoration then were creation of all this wetlands and then the plantings of the wetland plants and the upland plants. Let me go, go back for a minute to uh, the creek side. So the creek's important because it feeds into limits. But we were very lucky we found two professionals who work in this soil contamination issues on a regular basis who agreed to give us pro bono support to address the problem, or hopefully address the problem. So an attorney named Laurel Lockett, who's uh, out of a company called Car Carlton Fields up in the Tampa area, got involved, and she brought in a gentleman who was a toxicologist also with a firm called Geosyntex. And between the two of them, they started looking at what we should do to analyze the soil and figure out how to proceed. So they did a whole series of soil testing all over the site, and they got involved talking with the Florida DEP about what our options were. In the end, what we decided, and the DEP concurred, was that the project could proceed but we could not take any of the soil off site. Um, so essentially they said, well, you're not really in danger if you're just walking around on the soil. I mean, you're not in danger at the golf course when you're playing, for example. Um, you probably don't want kids digging in the soil. Um, you don't want to try and sell it somewhere else where it could introduce contamination. So you got to keep it on the site. So we had to stop now, we know what we need to do, but we had to redesign the plans in order to keep the soil on site. And the solution that we came up with was to create some hills and berms uh, on the site so that we could uh, do something with all the soil we were gonna excavate. So really what this next chart then shows you is what do we do? So if you look at the purple areas over on the, the second chart, that's where the golf course ponds were. And on the west side of the property, so the far left of the chart, is where Lemon Creek flows in and out of the property. So we left Lemon Creek here, where it was, but we expanded the estuarine wetlands by building out uh, shallow edges along the creek at the north end and then also expanding over here we, we basically took two of the old fairways and dug them out and created an entire new lagoon there. So we just about tripled the amount of estuarine wetlands that we've got out there now. On the other side we took out most of the culverts and we expanded the banks of four of the ponds out to the sides so that we could then put in uh, plantings all around the edges of those wetlands. And so what we have now is we've got all of that new wetland area and then in the green on this chart you can kind of see the solid green areas 
Those are the places that we deposited the soil that we took out of the wetlands as they did the excavation work. And they have turned out, it wasn't part of the original plan, but they've turned out to be a great benefit because if you are out on our trail network and you walk up on top of the mounds, you can now see what's going on out in the wetlands. And those of you who come Thursday will get a chance to see how this all is beginning to develop. So last year, 2021, is when most of this, sorry, 2020 is when most of this work was going on because we actually opened the preserve in January of last year. At the time that we opened it, there was still a lot of bare ground out there. Um, after the wetlands were created, we put in 80,000 wetland plantings along the ponds and the estuarine system. It's kind of amazing to think about what does it take to put in 80,000 plants, even if they're small. Most of them, though, you're putting in in the water, so we had professionals that came in and did that planting work. And then there were 14 zones in the uplands that we planned around the preserve where we put in uh, about 12 varieties of trees plus shrubs and grasses that hopefully will take over and eventually eliminate the pepper problem that we had before. So the major aspects of the restoration then were creation of all this wetlands and then the plantings of the wetland plants and the upland plants. Go back for a minute to uh, the creek side. So the creek's important because it feeds into Lemon Bay. Also, back and forth down the Lemon, Lemon Lake, Lake to the, to the south. south. Wow, this microphone. Sorry, guys, it's really disturbing me. But um, we can hear you. That's okay. Um, so, so Lemon, Lemon Creek. Creek. Lemon Creek's important because of that water quality, but it also is very important because it's a juvenile tarpon habitat. So since maybe 2013, we have been working with Florida Fish and Wildlife studying the juvenile tarpon that are in the creek. And the juvenile tarpon, actually tarpon, if you know their, anything about their life story, they're born offshore. And then they work their way into the bay and into backwater mangrove creeks like this one. And they live in those creeks for about two years before they then move back to the bay and eventually become the very large tarpon we see out in Boca Grande Pass and here along the beaches at times. So juvenile tarpon need that backwater, those mangrove backwaters to grow and what's going on in Florida right now is that there aren't very many mangrove backwaters that are still present because many of them have been uh, eliminated by the developments that are going on. So uh, the chance to do a project like this where we expand mangrove habitat instead of getting rid of it was uh, a very important benefit that we see out of this project. So FWC is continuing to do uh, the work with us. We, we take volunteers out every month. We have a 600 foot seine net that we take out into the creek at three locations, or I guess two now right Malcolm, two locations. And we actually run the net in a, a semi-circle, almost a circle, and pull it in and we study the tarp and another fish, snook, and other species that we catch in those same nets. So one of the things you're always welcome to do is come out and volunteer with the groups that do that every week. There is one that is show pointing out coming up, I guess, this Saturday. Yep. So um, on our calendar, by the way, lemonbaconservancy.org, we have a calendar of all our events coming up. We do a lot of nature walks. We do volunteer activities. Um, Lucia, who's over there in the pink top, is our volunteer coordinator for a lot of the projects we do out at the preserve. In fact, that's a whole Lemon Bay Conservancy table over there. You can ask any of them about the projects and things that are going on. Um, but the tarpon work is an important aspect of the restoration that we have. So let me divert now from talking a little bit about what's already been done to what still needs to be done. 
So all the money that we got donated was used in the actual construction of the project. And so now the maintenance and management and continuing improvements of the project have to be done by Lemon Bay Conservancy. And we're a pretty small nonprofit um, based here in Inglewood. We have been around, as Buffy said, for 50, now 51 years. But we, but we don't have the kind of deep pockets that a national organization would have. So we have to raise um, all of the donations and membership money to do our projects on our own. And to give you an idea of what's involved, um, just the invasive plant control with herbicides for a year this year. Our contract is $37,000 just to make sure that we don't get overrun again by Brazilian pepper and all the other species that come in and can take over the nat native plants that we put out there. We're in Charlotte County and Charlotte County Board of Directors has chosen not to tell nonprofits that they are away from non ad valorem taxes. So we don't pay regular property taxes, but we have to pay taxes on special districts in Charlotte County. And for our property here at the preserve, that's another $13,000 that we have to pay. We have hogs out on the site, so we have to have hog trappers. That's about $3,000. Need another $1,500 in insurance and $2,000 for equipment maintenance and gas. And those are just the beginning of the expenses. So you can see that it's well over $50,000 a year for us to maintain this property. So that's an ongoing challenge. And any of you who would like to come out and become members, we would love to have you. Um, Buffy mentioned that there are a lot of things the Conservancy does uh, beyond just this property. Uh, we have a team that's focused on water quality and we'll be focusing on Lemon Bay water quality in our February meeting, which uh, was in January. We just moved it to February 24th in hopes that the COVID situation will have died down a little bit by then. Um, we're also involved with seagrass monitoring and other water quality initiatives. We hope to have a series of neighborhood meetings focused on what individuals can do about water quality um, in the weeks ahead, but all of that we're playing by ear, depending on what the uh, situation is with COVID. So uh, out at the preserve, back to that for a minute, we do a whole series of nature walks, and you'll find all of those on our website. Um, but they are some of them general walks, as the one we'll do Thursday, just about what the preserve's about. But we're also doing um, edible plants walks, uh, we'll walk focused on the estuary and the plants and animals you'll find there, uh, the succession of plants that we expect to have over the next few years. Uh, we do birding walks, uh, so we have a whole range of activities that we do. And our volunteers are out there twice a week maintaining the trails and doing new projects. The one we have going on tomorrow is that we're creating a, what we hope will become a bird rookery island. So in the restoration, I don't know if you can see our trails back here, but there are two islands that we've created in the middle of the wetlands, one on the freshwater side and one over here on the saltwater side. And this one on the saltwater side is the first one we're trying to turn into a rookery island. And the approach that we're using is to build some uh, nesting platforms on the island and put them up. So tomorrow we'll be raising the first two of the nesting platforms. And then the island doesn't have really any major vegetation on it right now. So the next phase will be the plant vegetation that will eventually support the nest. But in the interim, we have to create some artificial nesting habitat. So that's a project we have underway. Um, the trail network I didn't really talk about, this last chart here behind me now, is the trail network. We've got about three miles of trails that we've put out there, and those are open to our members every day. By the way, our policy on the preserve is that members may visit at any time, but the general public is asked to only be at the site when we're having an organized walk or event. 
So because of insurance reasons and other factors, the preserve is not open to the public daily, only when we have a special event going on. But this trail network um, allows you to walk around and see all the various habitats that are at the site. And an important piece of the trail network is represented by this little pink bar over here because we built a bridge across the estuarine wetlands. There was another project that the Conservancy raised money for. That was, you don't think of things like this as being that expensive, but they are. Um, it was about $32,000 to put that wooden bridge in place. So, uh, plus the permitting and all the other things that are involved in that. So everything we do out there costs a lot of money, but we believe that we have an, an excellent site now for wildlife and an excellent site for all of us humans to go visit and learn more about the habitats that we've got out here um, at the preserve. So everyone is invited to come up and look at the charts as, um, after the presentation is over. And we have some handouts that um, Buffy and Pam will be giving you uh, people. One of them shows you the location of the preserve if you're gonna come out on Thursday. It's at 10 o'clock when we'll do our tour out there. We also have some of our newsletters that will tell you about other projects that Lemon Bay Conservancy is doing. And there's also a long uh, overview in there about uh, the uh, Wildflower Preserve itself. Now called Lemon Creek Wildflower Preserve. Yeah, I'm happy to take any questions and we'll have those handouts for you. Anybody have any questions about it? On that final map, the red is the trails through the park, and what about the yellow? Yeah. The yellow lines. <laughs> okay. Yeah, so the question is, what do the different colors represent um, on this chart? So we just divided the trail network into three colors, and if you're out there walking around, there are numbers on trail markers all around the preserve that tell you um, where you are. So if you're using our trail map and you get lost, you can just find the closest number. But the trail markers, the poles themselves on the, the east side are colored orange, so you know you're on the east side. And the trail markers in the middle are colored yellow, so you know you're in the middle of the preserve. And then the ones on the other side are coated red, so you know as a you know if you pass a trail marker you know which general part of the preserve you're in. David, you want all these handouts out? Anybody have any questions about on the final map the red is the trails through the park and what about the yellow? The yellow lines up here. <laughs> yeah so the question is what do the different colors represent um, on this chart? So we just divided the trail network into three colors, and if you're out there walking around, there are numbers on trail markers all around the preserve that tell you um, where you are. So if you're using our trail map and you get lost, you can just find the closest number. But the trail markers, the poles themselves on the, the east side are colored orange, so you know you're on the east side. And the trail markers in the middle are colored yellow, so you know you're in the middle of the preserve. And then the ones on the other side are coated red. So, you know, as a, you know, if you pass a trail marker, you know which general part of the preserve you're in. Also, you see on here there are um, some uh, pentagons uh, with letters. letters. That's a project that's still underway, but we're creating a whole series of educational signs and videos so that as you walk around the preserve, you'll be able to learn a little bit about um, different aspects of the preserve as you walk around, or, um, and also to be able to pull up on your phone and listen to a video uh, about the topic associated with that sign. One other tidbit while they're passing out the handouts. This um, mound over here doesn't have an official name. Some people call it the Gasparilla Mound, but um, at its top, it's about 20 feet above sea level. So other than the dump down by Punta Gorda, it's the highest uh, point in Charlotte County. <laughs> and it really is beautiful when you're up there to be able to look out over the wetlands and, and uh, 
see everything that's been created. And even people who came last January when we first opened the preserve, and you maybe were here last uh, winter, if you come back out for one of our walks, either the one Thursday or any of our other walks that are, are open to the public, as well as to our members, I think you'll be amazed to see how the, the vegetation has taken back over just in the course of a year. So. Okay. Any other questions? Or? Maybe we'll see some of you the next, next, next week. We have our next talk. So appreciate everybody coming. And thank you, Eva.